Okay, why don't we get uh, our last session started here. Um, welcome back, this is the final session of the colloquium. Uh, day two on infrastructure, and this last panel is on science education. So our first speaker is going to be Edward Larson. Uh, he is the Hugh and Hazel Darling Chair in Law and University Professor uh, of History at Pepperdine University. Uh, he teaches, lectures, and writes about issues of law, politics, science, and medicine from a historical perspective. He's the author of nine books and nearly 100 published articles, including uh, the fantastic book, uh, Summer, of the, Summer for the Gods, uh, The Scopes Trial, America's Continuing Debate Over Science and Religion, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize in History, uh, a remarkable book. Uh, his latest book, An Empire of Ice, Scott Shackleton and the Heroic Age of Antarctic Science, was a finalist for the 2012 uh, Hessel Tillman Prize in History. Well, let me just say it's a tremendous honor to be here uh, at this amazing place and before this um, uh, wonderful, wonderful symposium that you've all put together. Professor Calvelis de deserves incredible credit, as does the entire committee. Um, I've been asked to focus on the role of the NAS in the bio evolution teaching debate, and polls suggest that half of all Americans reject the theory of evolution, and most of the rest believe that God guides the process. In many places, these percentages are much higher. Given this, and America's long tradition of local control over public education, the question is not, why is evolution not taught more in public schools, but, but why is it taught as much as it is? If I'm limited to a three-letter answer, I'd say NAS, or NRC, the research arm of the NAS that has devised the National Science Education Standards. If I get, could give a four-letter answer, I might add Eugenie Scott, NCSE, but I'll let her expand on that. I'll stick with the NAS. I find it as easy as to understand, historically, the American controversy over teaching creation and evolution by seeing it in three historical phases with an ever-increasing role for the NAS in those successive phases. Uh, let me explain. The first phase of the creation evolution legal controversy featured a national religious crusade to outlaw the teaching of Darwinian theory of human evolution in public schools, leading to the passage of the first such statute in Tennessee, it wasn't the last, but the first, and the subsequent trial of John Scopes in 19. 25, in which several NAS members offered their expert testimony or public commentary for the defense. After Scopes' successful prosecution, other states and local school districts followed Tennessee in excluding Darwinism from the classroom. The NAS debated entering into the growing controversy at this point, and it even, in 1923, appointed a committee, the Committee on Organic Evolution, uh, to look into this. That committee, though, after preparing a statement which hailed evolution as truth and denounced its opponents for ignorance and intolerance, ended up not releasing that statement and left the matter to politics and the courts. The Supreme Court's landmark decision in 1947 in Everson versus Board of Education marked the beginning of the end of this first phase of the creation evolution legal controversy. By incorporating the uh, First Amendment bar against religious establishment to the liberties protected from state action by the 14th Amendment, Everson led to a series of rulings on state and local policies and practices promoting religion in public education which brought down the old anti-evolution laws. With the disappearance of those laws, however, opponents of Darwinian instruction began calling for the inclusion of alternative theories of organic origins in the biological curricula. Those calls ushered in a second phase of the anti-evolution legal controversy that began around 1970 and reached full force by 1980. 
This was marked by state statutes and school board regulations mandating that to counterbalance Darwinian instruction, schools also teach either the biblical account of creation or scientific evidence alleged to support that biblical Genesis account, which was, goes under the term creation science. Now the NAS got more publicly involved. In 1972, the NAS issued a resolution condemning measures mandating the teaching of creation science in science classrooms, and in 1984, it published and uh, widely distributed an attractive glossy brochure, I have a copy here, my old copy, very dog-eared, Science and um, Creationism, a view from the National Academy of Science, which distinguishes between evolution as science and creationism, or creation science, as religion, and roundly condemned teaching creation science in the science classroom. It's a longish book, but let me give you a flavor for it by reading just a brief passage from its conclusions. The goal of science is to seek naturalistic explanations for phenomena within the framework of natural laws and principles and operational rules of testability. It is therefore our unequivocal conclusion that creationism, with its accounts of the origins of life by supernatural means, is not science. Incorporating the teaching of such doctrines into a science curriculum stifles the development of critical thinking patterns in the developing mind and seriously compromises the best interests of public education. Well, copies of this booklet were sent to public school teachers and school boards around the country by the thousands. By all accounts, it had the effect of st stiffening the resolve of science teachers school board members, and state legislators who accepted the theory of evolution or opposed religion in public schools. Of course, by this biology teacher's own internal organization, up to a quarter of American high school biology teachers reject the Darwinian theory of human evolution and want to include creationism in the classroom. Similar or larger percentages of school board members and state legislators also accept creation science. On these, the, bo the, the brochure, the booklet, had less impact. Indeed, it aggravated many of them. Here, the court uh, stepped in to resolve the issue. Indeed, under the in then entrenched Establishment Clause principles, it did not take long for courts to end this second phase of the controversy. In 1982, after a widely publicized fact-finding trial, a federal district court declared unconstitutional an Arkansas law providing for balanced classroom treatment for creation science and evolution science. Five years later, in Edwards versus Aguilard, the United States Supreme Court settled the matter by finding Louisiana, Louisiana's Balanced Treatment Act, and I quote, advanced a religious doctrine by requiring either the banishment of the theory of evolution from public school classrooms or the presenting of a religious viewpoint that rejects evolution its, in its entirety." End quote. Here, the NAS again stepped in by filing a really quite remarkable and well-written amicus brief um, with the court, arguing that the theory of evolution was a purely and widely respected uh, scientific theory, while Creation science was simply religious dogma dra dressed up like science. Many Americans remained skeptical about Darwin Darwinism, however, and rejected the idea that it should be the only theory of origins taught in public schools. Perhaps the state could neither ban evolution and evolutionary instruction nor counterbalance it with religious or, quote, scientific, unquote, creationism. But could, could, they asked, could state or local school districts direct that biology courses incorporate questions about the sufficiency of Darwinism to explain natural phenomena or evidence of intelligent design in nature? Such questions gained traction among conservative Protestants during the 1990s and spawned litigation and legislation into this new century. This launched the third phase of the creation evolution controversy, which uh, continues unresolved to this day. The NAS remains fully engaged on two fronts. First, 
promoting evolution teaching through science, state science standards, and second, opposing the so-called intelligent design or ID agenda. I'll briefly introduce both. In uh, speaking first about the science standards, in 1988, uh, after the seminal A Nation at Risk report came out, Republican presidential nominee George Bush campaigned on a platform of education reform, the first time this traditionally state and local issue dominated a national election. At a highly publicized educational summit convened soon after his inauguration in 1989, Bush and the nation's governors, led by then Governor Bill Clinton of Arkansas, committed themselves to the goal of having students demonstrate competency in science, math, English, history, and geography by the end of the century. Bush called the program America 2000, and it focused the educational reform movement squarely on formulating national standards for what should be taught and learned in American public schools. In 1991, at the invitation of the National Science Teachers Association and Bush's Secretary of Education, the NAS assumed responsibility for drafting the standards for science education. Long a champion of rigorous instruction and evolution, the NAS now had the mandate to draft model standards for elementary and secondary uh, science education in American public schools. Working through the NRC, it did just that, and continues to do it through periodically revising its national science education standards. One by one, during the late 1990s, the various state boards and departments of education worked through the initial science setting process. Most states use the NAS standards as their working draft. By 2000, every state had adopted some form of science standards that at least addressed the topic of biological evolution, though a few avoided using the word itself. 46 of them specifically included the concept of species changing over time and of natural selection. 38 gave evidence for evolution. 21 discussed dissent with modification. Thanks to the NAS, evolution teaching gained ground through the science setting process. What is tested tends to be taught, and most states tied student assessment testing to their education standards. But the triumph of evolution was not uniform throughout. Some states treat biological evolution very gingerly in their standards, or not at all. Some never use the word, but do as good as possible given the restriction. A few states insert items such as creationist buzzwords like microevolution and macroevolution. Um, but three states, Kansas, Alabama, and Louisiana, are special cases. They illustrate the ID agenda and the NAS's responses to it. So let me close by going through those two states quickly. First, Kansas, where the federal mandate for education standards and a gradual consolidation of state authority over education and educational policies provoked a conservative reaction. By 1996, Republican candidates committed to local or parental control over public schools had won five of ten seats on the state's elected school board. Not all of these five conservatives um, came from re the religious right, and none campaigned on the edu evolution issue, but each distrust the, distrusted the professional educational establishment. In 1998, the State Commissioner of Education assembled a committee of Kansas science educators to draft the state's science standards. The drafting committee uh, hewed close to the NAS model. Board conservatives, however, offered a creationist alternative. Public hearings on the science standards became bitter battlegrounds between creationist parents and evolutionist educators. The drafting committee offered the compromise of just taking out the word evolution from its proposal, but the conservatives won the day um, by taking over the committee's proposal and deleting offending content, such as um, macroevolution and the Big Bang Theory. When it passed um, the, the uh, board, a national media frenzy followed. As a practical matter, however, in Kansas, attention soon focused on the 2000 Republican primary when four board conservatives would face the voters. The spotlight remained on Kansas throughout the election. Scores of national science organizations, uh, including the NAS, condemned the board's actions. 
Indeed, the NAS, as copyright holder of sections drawn from its model, blocked publication of the state's new science standards. On both sides, the election fo focused squarely on the issue of evolution in science education. With the nation watching, Kansas voted, voters turned out all but one of the conservatives. The reconstructed board promptly adopted new science standards modeled on the NAS template. Now Alabama. It took a different tact. As part of its science education standards, um, the State Board of Education uh, declared, and I quote, explanations of the origins of life and major groups of plants and animals, including humans, shall be treated as theory, not as fact. That was in its standards. Shortly thereafter, the board also adopted a specific disclaimer for inclusion in all bi evolutionary biology textbooks used in public schools. This disclaimer, which is printed right on the front page, depicts evolution as a controversial theory, differentiates between micro and macro evolution by noting that the latter, quote, should be considered a theory, um, and concluded with a list of allegedly unanswered questions about biological origins. Just so you know, microevolution and macroevolution are terms used in creation science to differentiate between changes within the kinds of plants and animals created by God as depicted in Genesis, that's microevolution, and changes from one basic kind or type of plant to another, that is macroevolution. Well, the NAS responded to this and other ID challenges to teaching evolution with a new glossy booklet, Teaching About Evolution and the Nature of Science. Here's my copy of that. After, um, after many examples and much discussion, this booklet concludes, and again, quoting briefly from the conclusion, the statements of science must invoke only natural, natural things and processes. This understanding has great practical value. The theory of, of evolution is one of those explanations. Then the booklet quotes from NAS biologist Ernst Meyer, who said, Virtually all scientists known to me have religion in the best sense of this word, but scientists do not invoke supernatural causations or divine revelation. Well, while um, Alabama's textbook disclaimer has never been challenged in court and remains in effect, similar disclaimers that suggested or endorsed religious ID or creationist alternatives to evolution, right in their text, have been struck down by the courts. The mixed results of the disclaimer battles led critics of Darwinian instruction to seek what they call academic freedom statutes, which encourage public schools to teach the controversy over Darwinism. Typically, these bills assert the rights of public school teachers and students to hold and express their own views on biological origins and other controversial scientific topics without identifying any specific alternative theory. They also do not single out only Darwinism for censure, which proved problematic in some legal cases, but also question global warming, human cloning, and other, quote, controversial theories. These bills continue to pop up in southern and midwestern state legislators to today. Most of the proposed academic freedom bills stalled, but in 2008, a proposed academic freedom statute found traction in the Louisiana legislature and passed. Last year, another, um, another passed in Tennessee, expertly crafted to survive constitutional challenge in the current Supreme Court. So far, um, neither statute has been challenged in court. After Louisiana's Academic Freedom Act passed, however, the NAS responded with another glossy booklet. I never got a copy of that when I had to print it off online, but it looks sort of like this. It's more colorful in reality. I'd love to get one before I leave, by the way. Um, um, and this booklet, like the others, was designed for mass distribution. What's wrong with teaching critical thinking or controversies with regard to evolution? The booklet asks and then answers. Nothing is wrong with teaching critical thinking, but critical thinking does not mean that all criticisms are equally valid. Critical thinking has to be based on rules of reason and evidence.
There is no scientific controversy about the basic facts of evolution. In this sense, the intelligent design movement's call to, quote, teach the controversy is unwarranted, end quote. Well, and so it stands. Today, in the ongoing chess match over teaching evolution and creation um, in American public schools, thanks to its science standards, the NAS has advanced the cause of science education considerably but has yet to checkmate its wily and determined creationist adversaries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Larson, for a very stimulating start to our panel. Our next speaker is Michael Foyer. Uh, he is the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Human Development and Professor of Education at the George Washington University. Previously he, worked, previously, he worked as the executive director of the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education at the NRC, where he was responsible for a broad portfolio of studies and other activities aimed at improved economic, social, and education policymaking, and was the founding director of the Board on Testing and Assessment. Michael. Well, thanks. Uh, pleasure to be here. This is coming home in a way. I. Um, I'm not sure that the sequence here is going to make the most sense to everybody because I'm actually not going to talk too much about science education, but I'm going to rather talk a little bit about uh, uh, a, a variation on that theme which has to do with the science of education. Uh, in fact, when I got here in 1993, I had the pleasure of um, just getting here a few months after then President Bruce Alberts had, uh, had come over. Um, and over that, um, well, subsequent uh, decade working with Bruce and then some, uh, we did a number of things here at the Academy which were oriented toward the notion of bringing the best possible scientific inquiry to bear on problems of American education. Um, there is a connection to science education, partly because uh, when Bruce became the president of the academy, he did so in large part because he wanted uh, this great institution to have a more prominent role in the improvement of science education, in particular at the K-12 level. Uh, but that led to a whole, um, a whole array of very interesting projects and activities that I believe, in retrospect, solidified the, the ideal of treating education as a complex phenomenon that warrants the most, uh, the highest standards of academic and scientific inquiry. Um, a little bit of context about American schools and schooling, which uh, I'm sure this is going to be familiar to all of you. Um, by design, the American public school system is fragmented. Uh, it is uh, by design in law, in fact, fragmented. Uh, we operate uh, with something like 15,000 more or less independent school districts in 50 states and territories uh, with school boards and a wide uh, a range of governance mechanisms, uh, organizations at the very local grassroots level making decisions about content, pedagogy, and the governance of schools and schooling. Uh, we may not like that, but that's the reality, and it's been that way pretty much uh, since at least the, the mid-19th century, uh, when a lot of the, the foundations for the current school system were put in place. Uh, the former president of Harvard, James Conant, once said that we don't actually have an education system in this country. We have a hodgepodge, and we like it that way. Um, I, I mention that uh, partly because uh, the part about we like it that way uh, is, in fact, one of the things that has led to a good bit of tension uh, in the world of education reform. And if you think about this fight about uh, creationism and teaching evolution or not teaching evolution in the schools, uh, it has something to do with this allergy that the American people have had for two centuries plus to the imposition of some kind of central authoritative position on matters of curriculum and standards and the like. Um, 
<clears throat> we've had, uh, during my time here, I was very lucky to be part of some absolutely fascinating experiences which, which really brought to life some of this complexity of trying to be scientific about this great big hodgepodge. I remember once a meeting in the boardroom of this building um, when President Alberts had um, invited the then French Minister of Education, who happens to be a member of the NAS, uh, his name is Claude Allegra. He was the Minister of uh, Education in France, and uh, Bruce invited him and his uh, entourage uh, to a meeting in the boardroom and gathered um, in there a few of the leading figures in the world of American education policy and reform, and the conversation was mostly about something that Bruce was very enamored of, as many of us were, uh, called hands-on science and inquiry-based pedagogy for elementary and secondary uh, teaching of science. Uh, Minister Allegra uh, made the point that uh, they had decided in France, I believe it was on a Monday, uh, that the curriculum would flip to uh, hands-on style and by the following Thursday all the schools in France had actually started doing it. You can imagine the others in the room, the American education policy reformers were all salivating with envy at the idea that there could be anything that authoritative and that quick. It took us, after all, 214 years in this country to dare to actually write down in words a definition of national educational goals. And when we did, uh, it came with a certain amount of uh, poignant irony, uh, such as one of the goals being that we would be first in the world in mathematics and science by the year 2000 which led one of the Washington wags to suggest that it was a typographical error and that what had been meant was that we would be first in the world in 2,000 years. <laughs> in any event, um, these, these, this, this conversation proceeded and Minister Allegra noticed the envy of uh, his American colleagues and he said, you know, um, I understand that you, you have a certain desire for centralized uh, control and authority. Keep in mind that in a system such as mine, where there is a great deal of decision making invested in the central authority, that leads to a certain amount of centralization of opposition as well. And we tuck that point away. And of course, six months later, it turned out that Minister Allegro was out of a job partly because he had dared to suggest that French teachers devote part of their summer, in particular, le mois d'août, uh, to professional development, um, and they didn't like that, and he lost his ministerial position. Um, there were many examples of this application of scientific standards and inquiry to uh, dealing with big problems in American education. In the 1997, I believe it was, State of the Union Address, President Clinton introduced the notion of something called the Voluntary National Test. The idea was that in this big uh, hodgepodge, we had lots of states and districts uh, using all kinds of tests to measure the performance of uh, American students, and we couldn't get a straight answer as to how we were actually doing. And the Voluntary National Test was essentially uh, an ideal of bringing a little bit of coherence to all of this uh, cacophony. And uh, in a way, in retrospect, it, it struck me that this was um, trying to turn the e pluribus unum problem of American democracy over to a group of psychometricians. Uh, it was a very complicated undertaking to develop a voluntary national test. I mean, if you just think about the phrasing, you can see what a very special context we work in. Um, as uh, Checker Finn, um, a, a well-known Washington education policy wonk, said at the time, there are only two things wrong with the idea of national testing, and that is that half the country hates the word testing and the other half hates the word national. <laughs> other than that, it seemed like a reasonable proposition. Um, among the things that that uh, proposal led to was exactly the question of what could be done with all of this uh, diversity of measures that we had in terms of 
trying to come up with at least an approximation of the national ethos and national set of standards about what we wanted kids to know and be able to do. And Congressman, um, oh, now I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a, an aging memory problem here. A, a very distinguished member of Congress proposed that we take all of the existing tests by the states and the districts and develop a way to report the results on a common scale. And this led to a request to the NRC to study the feasibility, the technical feasibility, the scientific merits of developing what became known as a kind of linkage model. Again, this was an e pluribus unum kind of situation. Um, and it turned out that the academy committee that was convened for that essentially tried very hard to figure out if that was possible and came to the conclusion that it didn't seem likely. Um, there were many other uh, examples of problems that arose because of an ideal of improvement in this system of schools and schooling that created very interesting fundamental challenges to scientific uh, analysis. Um, again, as a, as, a, as a result of the voluntary national test proposal, uh, we did a very important study called High Stakes, which actually my dear colleague Bob Hauser uh, chaired that committee. And among other things, uh, it became the basis for uh, some new analysis of data having to do with social promotion and other aspects of schools and schooling. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, just conclude with uh, one point, again, about science education. Uh, one of the most um, remarkable examples of how this institution really tried and continues to make a difference in the world of education policy and reform was indeed the science standards. And what that led to was the development of something here called the Board on Science Education which had the most remarkable, almost poetic acronym, BOSE. Poetic because it was chaired by Carl Wyman. And if you know of Carl Wyman's uh, work that uh, got him the Nobel Prize, it had to do with the Bose-Einstein theorem. So to have Carl Wyman as the first chair of Bose was a, was a delightful bit of, um, of poetry, I suppose. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that it was a very good thing to have eminent scientists from, in Carl's case, physics and other uh, of the scientific disciplines engaged in the complexities of education and not uh, giving up because of how hard and murky and political and ideologically fraught uh, these debates are. And fortunately for us and for the nation, people like Carl and then Helen Quinn who uh, I think is still currently the chair uh, of Bose, uh, have been doing remarkable uh, work in bringing science to bear on the problems of American education. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is David Goslin. Uh, he is past president and CEO of the Amer American Institutes for Research in the Behavioral Sciences and former executive director of the NRC's Commission on Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education. A uh, sociologist, he's the author or editor of four books, including The Search for Ability, Standardized Testing and Social Perspective, and The School in Contemporary Society. Thank you very much. I'm also going to talk about uh, the science of education and I'll leave it to you to bring it all back to, the, to, to science education. Uh, I'm gonna say a few words about the sciences that are relevant to education, all of which, or most of which, are the behavioral and social sciences. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the behavioral and social sciences at the National Research Council. And if there's any time left, I'll talk about some examples of the at least three or four dozen projects that have gone on within the National Research Council, and particularly in the social science divisions over the last 40 years, focused on education and education policy. What are the sciences that, or what parts of education does science, the social and behavioral sciences, have something to say about? 
Well, there are at least 10 or so areas. First, what are the capacities of learners? What are the differences among learners? What capacities do they bring to the learning process from the earliest days of their lives? And how do those capacities change and accumulate over time? Clearly, behavioral psychology. Uh, we even have some roles for some biologists in that. Development. Uh, what are the, the stages of development of human beings? And how does that interact with attempts to teach people different things or their, or their own learning on their own? Uh, third, what are learning processes? What are the most effective learning processes by which we convey information from one person or one group to another? Uh, transfer of learning. How, do you, how does transfer of learning occur from one domain to the next? Uh, how important is it that, the same, that we learn uh, concepts in different uh, con contexts? Uh, and clearly, it's, it turns out to be extremely important. Once upon a time, for example, we had uh, rules that children couldn't be taught reading until they'd passed a reading readiness test. Uh, we no longer uh, recognize that as a stage of learning that you had to be five years old or so before you could learn to read. What do we know about motivation? What is it that causes learners to persist and stay on task? even when it's boring, or even when they don't like it, and even when they don't understand it at first. In a room not very far from this hall, Herb Simon once said, motivation is the black hole of American psychology. American psychology has many theories of learning and very few theories of motivation, and yet the two are inextricably bound up with one another. What do we know about the role of family, uh, fathers and mothers, parents on children, the roles that they play before children get to school, for example? Uh, growing an impressive literature of information about parental influences on children. What do we know about teaching? What do we know about instructional uh, processes? There's a new, huge literature that's beginning to, we begin to talk about teaching styles, uh, strategies. Uh, how, do we, how do we cause teachers to learn to be teachers? Uh, Mike had a lot to say about uh, the educational system and its fragmentation. We have a similarly fragmented instructional system for training teachers in this country, with schools of education varying widely in quality in the kinds of people they recruit, what they do with them, the amount of training they get. We have almost no clear uh, transitions from uh, instruction and in learning how to teach and then having to go and be dumped in a classroom and have to teach. Uh, we're very different from the medical profession, for example. What do we know about schools and how they're structured? Uh, and how they are influenced by the neighborhoods, the cultures that surround them. And there's a very large scientific literature on the structure of the institution of schools, only part of which was uh, brushed upon by, by Mike. How do we measure the output of schools? Now we come to assessment. And we have a very long history of the development of tests of achievement. Uh, and it's becoming extreme steadily more sophisticated, and it's also become steadily more controversial, it's particularly in recent years as proposals have been made to link teacher performance evaluations to the performance of their students on standardized tests. What do we know about external influences on learning, external influences of peers, extracurricular activities, computers, TV, and other things which sometimes abet learning and sometimes impede learning. And though there's a very large literature in the behavioral and social sciences on that topic. Finally, a topic, uh, or next a topic, institutional change. How do we get schools to change? And that comes directly to the points made by Mike Foyer on how fragmented our school systems and our whole educational structure is. Uh, 
we are beginning to try to exert some influence at the national level uh, through the administration policies uh, race to the top and other incentive-based uh, procedures for changing schools. And finally, what about the economics of education? What do we know about funding for schools, disparities between fundings for schools in different areas with property-based uh, uh, taxes and the like as the principal means for funding our schools. All of these areas are areas in which the social and behavioral sciences uh, have information, theories, beginnings of scientific research that are relevant to what we do in our schools. I came to the National Research Council in 1974 uh, as the first, uh, almost the first executive director of what was then the Assembly of Behavioral and Social Sciences. There was no E in the Assembly of Behavioral and Social Sciences, so it was only social sciences, uh, behavioral and social sciences, no education. The education got added later. Now, the social sciences were relative newcomers to the membership of the National Academy of Sciences. While psychologists and anthropologists had been represented, well represented among the membership of the academy from early on in its life, uh, it was only in 1966 that the first sociologist, a demographer, Kingsley Davis, was elected to membership in the academy. Political science, sociology, all social psychology, all were added beginning in 1966. So that when I arrived to, to manage the behavioral and social science division of the National Research Council, I faced a situation where there were relatively few members of the academy who were social and behavioral scientists. Uh, and so we struggled with that. We struggled with uh, the other scientists who are members of the academy getting used to the fact that there were sociologists around, uh, and economists, uh, heaven forbid, economists. Uh, but, the, but the progress made within this institution was extraordinary. And the acceptance on the part of the academy of all of the social and behavioral sciences was really quite remarkable. I stayed here for 13 years and loved every minute of it. Uh, the first, I came here in 1974, I can tell you that the first education project in 1976 was a committee on fundamental research relevant to education. Uh, it was requested by the National Institute of Education to improve the scientific foundation of education in the United States. Uh, the director of NIE, Harold Hodgkinson, asked the committee to recommend how that strengthening might be accomplished by identifying promising lines of fundamental research. The committee, like many, like all, most academy studies, was a very multidisciplinary group. We even had an engineer. Uh, we had a psychobiologist, uh, a state superintendent of education, a philosopher, and a dean of a school of education, in addition to a number of distinguished behavioral and social scientists. The committee's report was published a year later, and it described eight examples of bodies of fundamental research that, in the committee's view, were of particular relevance to education. Understanding cognitive development, brain and neural processes, reading, education outside schools, innovation and change in educational institutions, school environments, educating children for a multicultural and multilingual society, and opportunities for higher education. The totality of both the research and policy literature in the field of education over the last 35 years reflect the prescience of that first committee's insights in 1977. The committee also spent considerable time thinking about the relationship between research relevant to education and educational practice and concluded remarkably for 1977 and we believe that education change is slower, more subtle, and more complex than usually envisioned. 
and one of, that one of the most important influences that fundamental research has on education comes through diffusion rather than dissemination. Even then, they knew how difficult it was going to be to change our schools. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. Uh, our next speaker is Eugenie Scott, um, the founding executive director of the National Center for Science Education. Uh, she's been a researcher and an activist in the creationism evolution controversy for more than 25 years, and recently the NCSE has taken up the issue of climate change and weighed in on that issue as well. Uh, she's the author of Evolution versus Creationism and co-editor with Glenn Branch of Not in Our Classrooms, Why Intelligent Design is Wrong for Our Schools. Uh, and finally, uh, but uh, not least, she is the recipient of the National Academy's Public Welfare Medal, uh, at, quote, in recognition of distinguished contributions in the application of science to the public welfare, uh, the most prestigious honor conferred by the Academy. So it is an honor to welcome Eugenie to the panel. Um, yes, I'm the current executive director of the National Center for Science Education. I'm retiring at the end of this year. Now, I'm retiring, not expiring. Uh, I'm still going to be continuing to work on the issues that I find very important, um, but I will be less active, clearly, in this area after the end of the year. And I mention that because I hope you will indulge me in a somewhat personal reflection on the role of the National Academy of Sciences in this area of science education, and particularly reflecting my area of interest and expertise and uh, Ed Larson's very wonderful introduction. In 1980 and 81, I and several other scientists at the University of Kentucky were opposing the introduction of creation science in the public schools of Lexington. We were joined by a strong teachers union and by the mainstream clergy, which did not want creation science to be taught Monday through Friday in this classroom and then have to straighten the kids out on the weekend because that wasn't their theology. Um, <clears throat> In 1981, I received a letter from Frank Press appointing me to an ad hoc committee on creationism. We had a one-day meeting in October at which I spoke about the problems of organizing scientists to work on issues like this, and I agreed with another member of the committee, a retired high school biology teacher, Stanley Weinberg, that all politics is local. Whether and how to teach evolution is a political issue much more than it is a scientific or pedagogical issue. And the solution to problems that arise over the teaching of evolution must be found locally by scientists, teachers, clergy, parents, and other interested people in individual states and communities. Frank Press and the others agreed. This was in 1981, remember, before the internet. If scientists were need to testify at a school board meeting in Springfield, and pick a Springfield, there's about 40 of them, um, the academy was not the institution to make this happen. It wasn't set up for local activism. What the academy could do, and better than just about any other organization, was to prepare an authoritative document that could be used by lawyers in future lawsuits, and there would be inevitable future lawsuits, and which might also be useful to help educate the public and the press. Hence the decision of the academy to write and publish Evolution and Creationism, the first one that Ed held up. And a separate decision by a group of scientists, some present at that room, Niles Eldridge, Maxine Singer, to help form a nonprofit organization that became the National Center for Science Education that would work at the grassroots level to provide citizens the scientific education and organizing advice needed to effectively defend science in the schools. So from a very early time then, a complementary relationship between the very large, powerful, and prestigious National Academy of Sciences and the National Center for Science Education, which can charitably be described by reversing all of those nice adjective, large, powerful, and prestigious, just used to describe the National Academy of Sciences. Seriously, the Academy has been a hugely valuable partner, even beyond the three versions of science and creationism booklets, and even beyond the extremely helpful website resources for teachers and the public that have been produced with the advent of the internet and the World Wide Web. 
I assure you, when the National Center for Science Education needed an amicus brief, okay, he's a lawyer, he says amicus. I took high school Latin, I say amicus, but you can always spot the lawyers because they say amicus. But anyway, when we needed an amicus brief, signed by scientific associations for Selman versus Cobb County, a Georgia case on disclaimers, we first went to the National Academy because we knew that if the Academy signed on, then the other associations would line up. And that's exactly what happened. We got 56 scientific societies and educational associations signing that amicus brief. That's pretty darn good. And the judge paid attention. He cited it in his decision. On many occasions, Bruce Alberts and Ralph Cicerone have had op-eds published in regional newspapers where there have been controversies over the teaching of evolution. Florida, Tennessee, Texas, many. Speaking with the authority of the most respected scientific society in the country. Even more valuable, actually. Even more valuable than having Ralph write an op-ed is the Academy asking its members in a particular state to speak up when evolution is under attack, to themselves write op-eds, to testify at Board of Education or Legislative Committee meetings. All politics is local. Local scientists have a much bigger clout even than national ones. And behind the scenes, very informally, NCSE staff have assisted National Academy staff to answer letters from the public about obscure points, like why polonium, halo, why polonium halos prove that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, or why polystrate trees prove Noah's flood. There's really no sense in the Academy staff wasting their extremely valuable time figuring out these arcane contentions. That's why you have us, right? The 1994 National Science Education Standards, largely because of the very smart way that the Academy conducted the writing and the critique and consensus analysis, had considerable influence on science education standards prepared by the states during the 1990s and 2000s, as Ed remarked. By bringing in educational leaders from around the country, from all the states, the National Academy of Sciences ensured that states were more likely to implement its approach when designing their own standards. They all bought into this NSES. The NES, NSES was therefore reflected in the state standards. Of course, we cannot forget the potential significance of the next generation science standards, which has been briefly mentioned, which because of the leadership of the academy and focusing upon the integration of inquiry learning with the content of science may, if implemented, 10 down, 40 to go, significantly change the teaching of science in the United States. Within time, the potential of significantly improving public science literacy. The Board on Science Education, mentioned by Michael, is owed a very big thank you for its diligent work on the NAS framework, which provided the blueprint for the next generation science standards. So thank you, National Academy of Sciences, for your help and leadership in science education, not only in the controversial issues of evolution and climate change, but for your leadership towards the overall improvement of STEM education across the board, something that all of us recognize as critically important to our nation. Here's to another 150 years. <laughs> Thank you. We are, uh, we have some time for discussion among ourselves, uh, which is the point. Um, uh, it seems to me that there's two intertwined issues here, um, which I hadn't really thought about before, but uh, there is um, science education, which is the teaching of science, uh, when this would include teaching of evolution. Uh, and then there's the science of education, which is how do you teach anything better? Um, and we've had kind of a, a, a mix of the two, but uh, first I'll give you all the opportunity to respond yourselves if you have any <coughs> particular issues that the others brought up. Well, I, I just want to add a footnote that um, one of the things that I've learned about the science of education is um, it's actually more of a process matter. Uh, we've invoked Herb Simon's name here a few times already just today, as far as I can remember. And uh, he made the distinction between substantive and procedural rationality. And I've, I've, I've been thinking a lot about that in the context of the substance and the process of being scientific about education. 
And one of the things that we, that is, is the hallmark of this institution is this, this business of consensus. And, you know, especially in an environment that is characterized by that kind of fragmentation and cacophony and everybody's an expert, you know, in a highly educated society like ours, one of the things that you get is a lot of people who've been to school and therefore who know exactly what's wrong with them and how to fix them. And <clears throat> absent some kind of political authority to make these determinations, the role of science as a, as, a, as a place that comes at it objectively, independently, with sort of standards of inquiry, becomes very significant. And consensus is uh, something that, is, that has made it possible for the science of education to, uh, to advance, I believe. And that's something that this place does uh, better than, than any other. Um, it's, it's costly um, and it's time consuming uh, to get consensus, but it's, uh, it's worth it because of the extra knowledge that is uh, produced along the way. And the science standards thing was a, was a terrific example of how do you get consensus? Uh, and what they did in the, in the first uh, uh, generation of the science standards, uh, I believe the, the well, this may be apocryphal, but it's not far off, there was something like 18,000 review comments oh, I it. That, that, were, that were received. And so now you try to synthesize that into a document that can be reflective of some kind of a consensus about what should be taught in science and how you can imagine that this has its, uh, its costs. But the, the added value of consensus seeking is very significant in this whole history, I believe. Because of decentralization. Yeah. Very important point. And something that gets lost, and may have gotten a teeny bit lost over the last couple of days, there have been a lot of conversations about committees that were formed to settle issues, uh, be it global <coughs> warming, whatever. Controversial topics about which there is disagreement, and the, society, and the academy is brought in to settle the disagreement. But there are a huge number of projects uh, here that are agenda building projects that are designed to pull together what is known about a particular topic, say what we know and what we don't know, and suggest research agendas for the future. Um, and many of the, much of the work in education over the last 30 years has, has been in, uh, in that general category of projects where the academy was asked, what do we know about X, Y, or Z, and what do we need to know and does it, what are its relevance to public policy, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, rendering a judgment about a particular scientific issue? I wanted to underscore a couple points that were made on this, um, on the, on, uh, that emphasizes the importance that the National Academy has played in this particular area, as Eugenie has stressed because you can look at the other areas and see the difference. Uh, decentralization is a hallmark of American education, and as we've witnessed with the government recently, um, that issue is not going away. The idea of local control um, and state control is still a very, very powerful force in America. Um, you could see that in the Goals 200, Goals 2000 program. Remember, that started in the, with Checker Finn, a person you mentioned, in the Reagan administration, um, with the Nation at Risk report, which came out of his shop, and then it um, moved on and was picked up by George Bush, so it had a Republican pedigree. And yet, um, when uh, Bill Clinton took over as president um, and continued to push it, and the original idea of these standards in all five areas, um, math, science, history, English, and there's one other, geography, I think, um, the, um, those standards, um, encountered an enormous buzzsaw because originally they were going to be the standards of each state were going to have to be approved by the Federal Department of Education. And um, unfortunately, the first to be released was the history standards, mistakenly brought out just before the 1994 election, which um, Democrats will never forget, because suddenly, led by Lynn Cheney, um, uh, the, at that time the wife of a former congressman, um, the, uh, they went after the history standards. That was introduced by a supposed national group. It was out at UCLA, the History Center, and it didn't happen to mention somebody. It didn't, they could go through history and figure out 
what multicultural, multicultural heroes were included and what true patriots were excluded. And it became a huge national issue. Bob Dole um, uh, uh, made it, uh, pushed it hard. Uh, Lynn Cheney pushed it hard. And it was a major force in the Republican revolution that won Congress in 1994. It was a truly a major issue in that election. Um, so the backlash could be enormous. And the result was when the new Congress came in, they immediately said that the, they, that Congress, that the Department of Education did not have the power to approve the standards. They could not approve them. Each state would have to come up with them, but there was no federal oversight. That was the shift. Now, those, sci those history standards didn't get very far. The reason why the science standards had the impact they did was because of the authority of the National Academy. There's simply not another organization in any of the other fields, such as history, that have the credibility of this organization. And this organization, thanks to Eugenie Scott, thanks to the credibility of this organization, the organization they had, they were able to push through despite a federal hammer and get most states to adopt things that followed very closely on the National Academy. Now, Eugenie's going to correct me on some things, but I do, I do want to stress that I think the importance of the National Academy, of having a voice that could try to herd the cats of these 50 states and 1,700 1, different school districts, had tremendous impact. I, I would take issue a little bit with you. Um, there were actually three guiding documents, one produced by NSTA, the National Science Teachers Association, one, one produced by the Scope and Sequence uh, our, uh, document, uh, AAAS's Benchmarks for Scientific Literacy, and the National Science Education Standards from the Academy. These three were all produced sort of at the same time. There was a comment made yesterday that I had to chuckle at. There's a certain problem in Washington of the NIH syndrome, not invented here. Uh, and so all three of these organizations had their own you know, guides as far as what uh, science uh, standards, all focusing on slightly different things, and that was fine. But the academy really had, I think, a disproportionate influence, even over the benchmarks, uh, in terms of uh, what individual states went out and actually wrote for themselves. Um, some states incorporated big chunks of the NSES. Other states used them as a guide and wrote their own. We are really, really decentralized. There's no question about that. States wanted to write their own. Um, it, it, but I really do think that a major factor for why the NSES was disproportionately more influential is because during the uh, discussion and the final, finalizing of the NSES, the uh, Academy brought in representatives from uh, of teacher leaders and State Department of Education leaders from around the country and got their input, listened to them, tweaked here and there, and formed a consensus. Not everybody was crazy about the NSES. There were things I would have liked to have fixed. There were things lots of people would have liked to have fixed. That has to be the case with a document like that. There's no question about it. But everybody agreed this is the way to go forward. Uh, improve, it, it's a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, other things can be done, but this would really make a big difference if something like this could be adopted by the states. And of course, another reason why the NSES was so much more successful than the history standards is, as Ed was saying, there was no federal club involved. This was totally voluntary. You know, the Academy, with all of its prestige and all of its ability and all of its brain power, said, here, for free. Look what we've done for you. Take it or leave it. And lots of people took it because it was so much better than what they could come up with if they just started from scratch. But it was voluntary. And given the pressures of American education, that's very important. We're having the same problem uh, right now with the NGSS, the Next Generation Science Standards. I was um, listening to a particular network news, which is not famous for supporting the current administration. And I heard a reference to the Common Core standards, which are standards in math and English, which were developed by the states. Again, it's not a federal program. The Common Core standards referred to as Obama Core. 
Obama had nothing to do with the Common Core Standards. He's got nothing to do with the NGSS. But this is how it's being packaged in a lot of states around the country. That this is a federal imposition on your local control of education. So reject, uh, if, if you've already adopted Common Core, change your mind and reject it. And certainly don't uh, adopt that NGSS program. So we've got a lot of education to do. One of the uh, hallmarks of having a decentralized uh, education system like we have, contrasting with the wonderful description of the French system that uh, Michael gave us, is that it's highly politicized. And whenever you have a social institution that's highly politicized, decisions get made not necessarily on empirical evidence. They get made on other grounds, such as who is voting. And um, all of those people listening to that particular television station that does not like the administration. Each of those people has one vote, which as last time I checked was the same number of votes that any individual scientist has. I'm a really cheery sort, aren't I? <laughs> I have kind of a random question, uh, and that I, I love this point about all pol politics are local, and then what is the role for a national academy? Um, there is a California Academy of Sciences um, and are there comparable institutions on state or local levels through which the academy can engage these issues relevant to science education? I would rather have a local science teacher and a local clergyman show up at the local school board meeting to testify than Ralph. However, much, however fond I am of Ralph, and he, he, he understands what I'm saying here. It's because a local person is going to have a lot more influ influence than some carpetbagger. This is why I don't fly around the country, except for Texas, I make an exception. Uh, my staff and I don't go around the country solving people's problems. We hand out the fire extinguishers, and we train, we, we give people the tools to uh, solve these problems locally because that's very important. Now, the role for a state academy of science, most states do have state academies of science. They're not really tied closely with the national, but you know, there's correspondence. And the role for a national academy of sciences, engineering, institute of medicine, is to be the leader, is to be the city on the hill, is to show people what to do and uh, provide the, um, the batteries for the fire extinguisher, if you will, um, provide the materials that can then be taken uh, by citizens to solve these problems. But, you know, the t unfortunately, education is politicized, and what is taught is a highly political decision, which is made at a local level and or at a state level. And so um, scientists have to understand that, and they have to work with it. And there are ways of working with it a little bit historically on the State Academy of Sciences. Uh, I mentioned that in the first phase of the anti-evolution crusade, the one that we probably all know best thanks to watching Inherit the Wind and television shows and movies like that and plays like that, um, when there was a national crusade against teaching of evolution. And I mentioned that they formally, finally formed a committee here, or they formed a committee here, and it came up with a resolution, which I could share more about, but um, ended up not releasing it and actually deciding that we're about research, not about education. That was actually their decision. And uh, this has very little to do with research. They haven't tried to limit evolutionary research, and therefore we're not going to get involved. Um, it was the State Academy of Sciences. Um, that's the history that I've gone state by state in that period. And in every, these bills were introduced in, um, in a majority of states. They gained tremendous traction. They passed, of course, in three states. Lesser restrictions passed in a, dozen, in a half dozen more, like Texas um, uh, and Oklahoma. Um, total bans in, in Kentucky, uh, in uh, Tennessee, Missouri, um, Mississippi, and Arkansas. Um, but they, the bills appeared in Minnesota and were Ohio, all over the country, and were heavily debated. In every case, it was the State Academy of Sciences that led the opposition. The State Academy of Sciences was on the scene in Dayton. It was their members who were testifying in Dayton, along with National Academy. They brought in some people from Princeton and, and Chicago, but the, most of them, 
Um, it was the state geologists, it was the state academy of sciences, it was the, those groups that banded together. That was before the committees on correspondence, which um, Eugenie Scott's been involved with, which have taken up the load, load now. But if you went back to the 1920s, instead of the, academy, uh, the court committees on correspondence, which have been the more recent development, it was the state academy of sciences. They worked together, they stepped up to the plate. Now, state academy of sciences are not as strong now as they were in the 1920s, relative. Um, but there they played a major role still to this day, and Eugenie knows this even better than I do, still in this day, it depends on the state. In Kansas, they were very helpful um, when the issue broke in Kansas. In other states, they're, they're, they're almost uh, non-functioning. In some states, they have actually have a significant number of creationists in the state academies, and it, it, it impacts their ability to react. But I know in Kansas they played a big role, and in some other states. So uh, there's still a factor there. They're not closely related with the National Academy, um, and uh, we should um, pay better attention to them. Okay, well, we want to make sure we leave time for questions from the audience. Um, so the microphones are open. And we have. Assembling. Sorry, I can't see against the light. That's, it, it, I, I appreciate that. That's why I wore a shirt, so you. Okay. I'm not <laughs> surrendering. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to ask a trivial question after I try to make a substantive point. Um, the substantive point is that, and it has to do with the social sciences in, in NSF and, and the National Academy. Um, some of the earlier hesitancies back in the 70s and the 80s is that the stuff we studied is more likely to turn controversial, therefore, you get the backlash problem. Um, and therefore, we better, we don't want to sort of take that chance of being associated with what will turn out to be very controversial kinds of arguments that will come from the social sciences. The important thing about this panel, and indeed other things have gone on uh, at this symposium, is that uh, no science is immune from controversy. <laughs> Uh, obviously, we're talking about two very large controversies today. Uh, we have one yesterday, climate change, and today, of course, uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory. I simply make that point uh, to, to complement the fact that the, the Academy went ahead, and as did the NSF, and, and uh, bit the bullet, so to speak, and said, we're going to do it because we have to do this in order to have a healthier scientific community in the, in the country. So that's just a footnote to, to, the, uh, to the discussion. My very trivial comment or question, however, is uh, to David Goslin. Um, so why did we add the E? I would have thought that education <laughs> was already a social science. If you know, it, why didn't we add a C for criminology and so forth and so on? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that question. That's to me, it's lost in the mist of <laughs> history. Uh, I was here when the E was added because I bridged between the Assembly of Behavioral and Social Sciences and CBAS. Maybe it was because uh, it's, we changed the, the change from an assembly fairly quickly into a commission and there was another reorganization. Um, there probably was some implication that there, that there is some uh, a difference between behavioral and social science and education, or that, and as I put it, the there are many behavioral and social sciences that have something to do with education, and there is not, in my judgment, as such a science of education. There are social sciences that have much to say about education. There's an educational system and a process. If we want to know about all of those components of it, um, I think we look to the behavioral and social sciences for answers. But I can't, quite frankly, remember um, what happened at the National Governing Board or, or the council that changed that, put the E on it. What? And our guys. I, I know. That's uh, why we have our historians. Uh, we haven't learned that yet, but I would bet that uh, Janice or Dan Barbera could answer that uh, on the spot for us. I, I don't know the history of that either, Ken, except I have a more charitable interpretation, which is that this was turned into a commission about the behavioral and social sciences and education. In other words, how the behavioral and social sciences relate to education. Um, this is um, just maybe more of a comment and a context. Um, I was struck by um, the, the fact that we're talking about this issue of science in education and science education 
in the context of the history of the academy. And one of the, what, what kept running through my mind as you all talked, was the fact that high school graduation was not a majority qualification, educational qualification in the United States until about 1950, when it was about 50 percent, and it's you know it's it it's, it goes into the 80 percentile range, um, you know, 20, 30 years later. So there's also the fact that the educational system not only is it diverse, but it is affecting um, the the kind of you know the science is being taught to a much greater proportion of the American population, and therefore it's a more salient piece of the curriculum in the last 50, 60 years. And so in that sense, I can understand why the Academy uh, didn't, you know, got involved more recently and didn't in the 20s in the same way, and also why the national, the question of national standards is a very recent one. So it seems to me it has, it has to do with the changes in the educational system and its extraordinary explosion and growth, which of course also um, from the science world we see most clearly in higher education. That's all. Uh, this is a question that I want to ask you a question to, to answer for him. It, it, I'm not 100% certain about this, but if you take the data on the number of people uh, believing in evolution as opposed to uh, divine creation, it seems to me that the number of believing in evolution has gone down. Isn't it hasn't increased over the last 20 years. Do we know the answer to this yeah. question? Well, it's, it's a little tricky. Um, it should, go, if, if what you say is right, high school graduation has gone up, science is therefore being taught to more students, we should be, as a country, getting smarter. It's not a clear well, to me that we are. Being more informed, that smart well, is different. Well, okay, I understand. Ignorance and stupidity are different. Uh, I understand. <laughs> and, and as for the st statistics on it, um, it's a little tricky to try to track because actually the notion that the world was created 6,000 years ago and that, um, that in six literal days is actually relatively recent. Um, it only really gained traction um, in the 1950s with the work of Henry Morris and the Institute of Creation Research. If you go back to even William Jennings Bryan, who led the anti-evolution crusade, um, he believed the days um, in Genesis were, were meant ages, and he testified to that effect at the Scopes trial. He said, I don't know whether the Earth is 6,000 years old or 600 million years old, he testified. It doesn't matter. That what matters is that God created humans. Um, he didn't even oppose evolution of, of other animals. He had no problem with that was just humans need to be created in the image of God. That's where the proto-fundamentalist church stood. So the idea that, 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 the idea that, the, that all the kinds were directly created and that it was a six-day creation within the last 10,000 years, which apparently about 40% of the American people believe, depending on how you look at the polls, is actually really of relatively recent origin. Um, the last 50 to uh, 70 years. So you're not really talking, of, and, and, where, and that is what is taught in many Christian high schools, which are growing in increasing numbers. They use the books that come out of Henry Morris and the Institute of Creation Research. This has its roots in Seventh-day Adventist um, um, thinking, which gave new uh, emphasis on, on Genesis. So you can't really track these um, necessarily over time historically, but I do want to underscore the point that was made by the excellent question. Um, comp high school compulsory education dates from around the 1920s. So before that, you, did not, you only had compulsory education to grade, uh, eighth grade. Um, no one was advocating, or very few people were advocating teaching concepts like evolution in those first eight grades. So I've gone back through the textbooks. I mean, the grade school textbooks, you know, they might talk about evolution, they might not. But it wasn't a big issue until you had high schools. And that's, where con was, that's what confronted people. And it's a little known, it's, a, it's an often forgotten fact that it was the same Tennessee state legislature 
that was the first to mandate and fund statewide high school education that included in the bill the ban on teaching evolution. They went together because it wasn't an issue before that. Um, so it brought the issue to more people and it made it compulsory and that gave the opponents a reason. They said, you're forcing our students to go to school and now you're teaching them human evolution. That was the only issue there. You're teaching them that humans weren't created in God's image. So it's the connection between those two, as you point out. And before that time, there was no opposition because high school was optional. And uh, it's just like nobody really matters if colleges teach it because you don't have to go to college. And you can go off to a, a Bible Institute if you want to. And to, let me add, just closing, one more point on your how you certify teachers. Many of these Bible institutes, whether it be Covenant College in Tennessee or Biola in California or these others that, are, that are, believe in the young earth creationism of creation science, are authorized to certify biology teachers. Certification is usually a state process. No, but they but are, they are, but they they are qualified to, to, right. to stand. They are approved that by passing, getting a degree from there, you qualify. They, they have a certification pro program. There, and and there, there's a lovely backstory there, too, because um, normally a uh, college or university, um, the ones that probably most of us went to, are certified by WASC or the Southern, you know, Western Association of Colleges and Schools is what the western part of the country, and, and there's these institutions that, that really will go and examine a university or a college to see whether they're giving an adequate education, whether they have good um, financial controls and all these other sorts of things, and then you are accredited. And so a student graduating from one of those institutions therefore can um, go on to many graduate schools or, or stand for a, a teaching exam. Um, there is a uh, accrediting agency that accredits Christian schools, uh, specifically with a young earth uh, or special creation point of view. Um, and that, insta that, that, is, that is not an equivalent to WASC accreditation, trust me. But it is an accreditation of a sort, and it is recognized by the uh, Federal Department of Education. Um, it's a complicated subject, a very complicated subject. But the point being that there is very likely uh, people sifting into the public schools who are, uh, and, and they write about it on websites, they are looking at their public school instructional um, activities as a mission to, to try to bring more um, students who don't know Christ to Christ and, and uh, thus fulfill their salvation. It's not a, not a good thought for people who think the First Amendment's a really good idea. Um, Matt, Professor Meslin would like to weigh in on this particular question. We have a publication on the National Center for Science Education website that I would encourage you to, to take a look at. It's called Voices for Evolution. And it has statements about the importance of evolution as a valid science, et cetera, from a lot of different kinds of institutions, like science organizations, that is, I'm getting to it. The most important section is the statements from religious organizations. They're already on board. But, Woods, but, sounds like but, Woods Hole to me. But it, it, sounds like, it sounds like your assumption is that these religious leaders need to be convinced of evolution. Maybe they feel we need to be and that is not true. Because I can show you... They would not go. No, no, they don't need to go. They're already on our side. Um, we have statements in Voices for Evolution from Catholic uh, institutions, from all of the mainstream Protestant... Pardon me? Repeatedly. The Pope has spoken repeatedly that evolution is valid science. Yeah, so, I mean, what, what was much more interesting experience, frankly, is to sit down with the evangelical Christians who accept evolution. And because those are our best ambassadors to the rest of the conservative community 
conservative Christian community that doesn't. Um, breaking bread is important. I have found, just to quickly add on that, um, one of your members, Francis Collins, um, when he gets together, he used to get together with somebody like, um, I remember talking to Chuck Colson when Chuck Colson was a, a former something or other for Nixon and later became a, a fought hard against the teaching of evolution. I mean, he, he was, he was a, along with Dr. James Dobson of, of, of Colorado Springs, they were tremendously influential in drawing the, um, a, a broader evolution, uh, broader evangelical community, far broader than Henry Morris could have ever reached. And um, uh, Chuck Colson said that, you know, talk, he, he didn't convince him, but talking with Francis Collins was the first time he ever could conceive that there was something on the other side. Um, so um, a person like Francis Collins can make, a, can make a big difference. Ken Miller among the Catholics is, is extraordinary. Um, he goes around to Christian schools, but um, yeah, those, that's, a, that's a tremendous asset and a resource and spending time together, as you say, with Francis Collins would be very helpful for lots of these people. Okay, I want to make sure we get in. I think this is going to be, have to be the last question for which I apologize, but hopefully if there are continued questions, maybe uh, we can continue the conversation for those who don't need to run off. Uh, Sylvia. Uh, I'm just, boy, that is. Is that Sylvia? Uh, yes, that's who it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just curious from the panel what similarities and differences you see between the teaching of evolution and the teaching of climate change as an issue for K-12. Climate change. The National Center for Science Education started as a, to, to help keep evolution in the public schools. We noticed a few years ago that just as teachers get beat up for teaching evolution, so to speak, uh, so they also are get major pushback for teaching climate change. Um, we see some very definite patterns in the resistance to teaching climate change, which is why we included climate change along with evolution in our portfolio, if you will. Um, there, are, there are three pillars of denial, if you will. Attack the science. So the science of evolution is weak, the science of climate change is weak, reject the science, and therefore you can make up your own mind. Um, an ideological pillar, in the case of evolution, the ideology is religion, it disagrees with my religion, so therefore I can't accept evolution. In the case of climate change, it's not so much religious ideology as political and economic ideology. Uh, climate change is a uh, liberal plot to increase the power of big government and take away our individual freedoms and uh, uh, endanger the country's national security. Um, the third is a cultural pillar, if you will, uh, which is very similar in the two controversies. Uh, the cultural pillar is to is to um, seize hold of some American cultural value that is is very powerful and um, associate yourself with it. So in the case of the evolution issue and also the uh, climate change issue, it's um, freedom of expression, uh, fairness, equal time. If you teach evolution, you should at least teach creationism to balance it out. If you teach evolution, you should at least, at least teach intelligent design to balance it out. If you teach evolution, you should at least teach the evidence against evolution to balance it out. The, the details have evolved, but the, the, the pattern is the same. Um, what we're finding is uh, in these academic freedom bills that Ed mentioned very briefly, and you can find a great deal more about them if you go to ncse.com. Um, these academic freedom bills, uh, the more recent ones are bundling um, evolution and climate change and a couple of other topics like stem cells and cloning, like this is taught in high school, you know, the cloning lab down the hall. But, you know. um, but the idea is that you should treat evolution and climate change differently from all other topics in the curriculum. Uh, single them out for the special teach both, uh, the evidence for and the evidence against. And of course, it appeals very much to American cultural values of fairness and um, e even handedness and equality, which are great values, but pretty irrelevant to what you should teach a 10th grader about accepted science. So yeah, we see a lot of parallels, which is why we added climate change to evolution and you know, we, we have resources for uh, defending the teaching of climate change on our website as well.
having tests for teachers. We talk about tests for kids. Why shouldn't um, teachers be subjected to some uh, professional tests like doctors are, like lawyers are, uh, yes, that's done routinely? Um, what is it about teaching uh, that says we do have some? Do that? We do. Yeah, it's, it's part so, of the. We do have some tests for teachers. ETS has a, has a teacher oh, sure. test. A thing called Praxis, and there's yes, all kinds. That's not required. That's correct. That's, well, well, but in different places, again, this is part of the fragmentation story. Yeah. In different places, it is required, and it depends on what state you want to be certified in and what the rules are for getting licensed and, and uh, accredited. It's not, it, it, there's plenty of room for improvement here, I'm just saying, it's not as if we so, don't do any of that. Uh, but, but I thought you didn't, you, you aren't a big fan of testing, usually. <laughs> You're not a big fan of testing, in, usually, as I understand it, so the tests that we oh, use as I a way to, a big fan of, of improvement of teaching, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so are exams for um, teachers. Yeah. There's reciprocity and there are things like that. But the practice tests are not required right. uh, everywhere at all. And some places have no tests. You have your degree and uh, you get, if you've taken the right number of courses, you can get certified. In many states, you're absolutely correct, in many states, um, you simply have to get a degree from a school that has been approved by the state, um, which in some states are Bible schools, um, and they're approved to teach in different areas. In other states, there are somewhat different requirements, but what you, you make your comparison with medicine. I know my poor wife is struggling, I mean, not struggling, she'll do fine, but she's, you know, she has to take her, her new boards, they have to do them every so many years in each field of medicine. And you don't have that in, um, you don't have that in um, science education or in education generally in most states. Um, and uh, it's, it's not only do you get resistance from the, probably from a lot of local conservatives in some way, but the teachers unions oppose them too. And I agree with you that tests would be a good idea, but that's not enough because clearly you can know your biology or chemistry and not be able to teach it uh, very well. And the countries, we're now learning more and more about the countries that are rapidly passing the United States in their educational achievement of their students. And we're finding out that they have really sophisticated ways of judging performance of teachers, peer, peer reviewing of teachers, other teachers in the classroom observing each other. Uh, and so we're, they're getting very sophisticated about making sure that teachers know what they're doing. I'll just put in a plug for a report that's coming out next Friday from the National Academy of Education, which is not part of the National Academies here but is the body, is an organization that represents uh, good education research. We have a report coming out next week about the evaluation of teacher preparation, which gets to a lot of these issues. So watch our website, National Academy of Education dot something. I think the fact that this conversation uh, could continue um, for quite a uh, uh, longer time um, I think speaks to the uh, interest in the subject um, and the importance of it. Um, and let me just briefly conclude the conference, um, and I will speak for Dan and Ruth, I think, um, by thanking the members of this panel, first of all, um, but also all of our speakers and panelists for what have been really enlightening and insightful and often provocative comments. Uh, as usual with such meetings, it's not just what we talked about here uh, on the stage, but also the conversations that went on over uh, the breaks and the meals. Uh, and all of this will inform uh, the history that Dan and Ruth and I are writing. Um, but beyond that, I think, uh, or, uh, I think the colloquium has made clear that, um, well, three things. One, that the Academy has really touched uh, almost every aspect of American science and technology over the last uh, century and more. Um, that much of this history is uh, not well known or not well enough known. And uh, number three, that much of this history is uh, more than amply documented in the uh, Academy's abundantly rich archives um, 
and um, just a remarkable resource, especially when you compare it to some other institutions uh, in American science. And for his, his, we historians who work on this stuff, it is a pleasure to run across an institution that has had the foresight to preserve and document its history and make it available to historians. Um, in our research, we've run across already, uh, just in our preliminary research, uh, dozens of topics that could be the basis for seminar papers, dissertations, uh, book projects. Uh, so we encourage historians to start taking advantage of the opportunity that's presented by this academy. Um, we would thank, there's a number of people who thank, I'm going to give Ralph the last word um, to wrap up the conference because we above all thank Ralph and the Academy for hosting this conference and allowing us to convene here and share our thoughts. Thank you. First of all, I have to apologize to Peter. <clears throat> Everybody up here at the, at the table has had to deal with the lights right in their face and we told Peter this afternoon that we would try to equip him with the same kind of baseball cap that Dan Kevlis was wearing, only it would be Boston Red Sox. And the one person in this building who has a Red Sox hat cannot be located. I, ap I apologize. <clears throat> Seriously, sticking with this panel for a moment, I think all of us really appreciate and respect what you've provided here this afternoon and, and also individually the work that each one of you has done over the years. I think we're all very respectful and appreciative for it, so thank you. I want to thank the organizers again of this meeting. <clears throat> Bob Hauser, who had to leave this afternoon with a family illness, and he really regrets that, but also Maxine Singer, Bert Richter, uh, Barbara Torrey, and Peter Westwick and they were assisted by Dan Kevlis and Ruth Schwartz Cohen, so thank you. Uh, this was not an easy undertaking, <clears throat> but I wanna tell you also that it's part of <clears throat> our own internal commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Academy. Just a couple of quick things. It's just been stunning to me to think in these last few months about what it must have been like in the middle of the Civil War for the Congress and President Lincoln to pass and enact the Morrill Act creating the public universities in this country. What a, what a remarkable thing to do in the middle of a war when it wasn't even clear that a, a country would emerge, but they were preparing for the future. They finished the appropriations to get the transcontinental railroad done to bind the country together. There was the Emancipation Proclamation itself and the creation of the National Academy of Sciences. And we've tried to understand what the goals were. <clears throat> Dan, <clears throat> Dan gave us a lecture the other day on how the first <clears throat> 50 to 100 years went. And of course, there were opposing forces and so forth. But something happened here in this auditorium at the end of April that uh, most of you didn't get to hear. President Obama came and marked the 150th anniversary of the creation of the National Academy of Sciences. And he stood up here, you know, he is a pretty good speaker, uh, and he talked about the first study that the federal government asked the Academy for, and it had to do with how to <clears throat> begin to win battles with the Confederacy that were fought on water, and how the Union forces might be able to navigate uh, with these new ironclad ships which were screwing up the magnetic devices and compasses that were allowing navigation. And Obama looked up and he said, well, the study came through, it took about nine months, but it came through and he said it really worked. They were able to fix up these devices and the Union started winning these battles on water. And Michael Foyer knows the story well. But then President Obama looked up from his speech and said, pointing to the people in this auditorium, he said, you know, if that first study hadn't gone so well, you might not be here today. <laughs> and then he said, and neither would I. <laughs> that was very good. So as Peter was just hinting, we really look forward to the book that co will come out of uh, Dan Kevlis and Ruth and Peter Westwick. It's probably, it will probably be a much more scholarly assessment than we've seen before and an assessment of some of the value and mistakes and counterforces and, but I think in a nutshell, the advantage that our country has by having access to these 
organizations outside of government who try very hard to be non-political, non-partisan, and objective. The Sackler Colloquium celebrating service to the nation, I think, has been very stimulating and revealing of many of the forces and facts and patterns that have characterized the work of these, these groups and how to improve them, how to learn from mistakes, and so forth. We know that a lot of people have been participating in a way over the web of this symposium. Uh, I have a preliminary number. I don't know exactly what it means, but about a thousand people yesterday. I don't know what the hour by hour distribution was, but we are receiving comments back from people who have been listening to the webcast and watching it. It's very, very favorable. So once again, we have to thank the organizers, the speakers, the panelists for everything you've done because it has been followed by many more people even than we're here. And I think the participation of the audience here has been terrific. You can see by the kinds and numbers of questions that are being thrown at the panelists, it's been great. So we're very appreciative. We plan to learn from these discussions and we certainly look forward to the book. We're going to continue some other activities celebrating this and commemorating this 150th anniversary throughout the year. We'll try to keep you posted. So thanks again, Peter.